Mirë që mësoj që t'jemi gërë të mund të fundojnë sesionin pas vitet. Kemi ndjerë që e përpara jo kështë tani të prezentojnë fozin e radhës, të shkarë sursëta që është drejtorë e ekzekutivë i kolegjën dhe universitetë të këtore për mora në rështë të bashkëmërë të Amerikës. Kjo është mërë që një parë dhe të në ti është nga agencia e gjurëve të reformacionë. Profesor, votë të në një të 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 I hope you will find something helpful from my contributions. I will have to omit some of my presentation because it has been covered by others. Uh, for the sake of the translators, I hope to stay in the same order, but there may be times when we will drop a little lower in my manuscript. It is important for you to know that I am a son of the Protestant Reformation. My own ancestors were some of the first European Christians to adopt the Protestant position. Many of my ancestors came from the northern provinces of the Netherlands, where Protestantism became dominant already in the 16th century. Others originally came from France, French Huguenots, who later moved from France to the Netherlands as religious refugees because of the religious persecution the Protestants experienced there during the 17th century. So when my own ancestors relocated from Europe to the United States at the end of the 19th century, they already had centuries of Protestant thinking within their hearts. When they migrated to America, they maintained those convictions, establishing Protestant schools and churches in their new country of America, so that those Protestant convictions could be nurtured and spread within their new homeland. What I want to discuss today are some of the enduring footprints of the Reformation that my ancestors believed were important to maintain in whatever century they lived and in whatever country they resided. The first I will mention only briefly. The first enduring first footprint is that the Protestant Reformation moved the center of religion from the church to daily life. That's part of the implication of the priesthood of all believers that has been talked about already in this conference. Now it was no longer the priests in the church who were given the title Father, in the Protestant way of thinking, true Christian fathers were found in every home where a man gathered his wife, his children, even his employees or servants together around a family table. There they learned together what the Bible taught and what God wanted them to do. And so also the most holy women in the Christian faith were no longer those who lived in the cloisters as dedicated nuns. In the Protestant way of thinking, true Christian sisters were those who nurtured their children as believers in Jesus and as students of the Bible. And we will hear more about the role of Katerina von Bora in helping set that tone. That's also why education became so important. The education of all, and the education of women included. Whatever social status, whatever gender. Because each person needs to know how to read the Bible, how to study it, and to learn how to live according to God's will as the Holy Spirit through the Word reveals it to them. The second footprint the Protestant Reformation changed the understanding of the Bible. 
It's already been mentioned in this conference that the Bible has changed from an instrument of power used by elites to control the masses. In the Protestant way of thinking, each man and woman needed to understand the Bible for themselves so that they could make their own decisions in their own hearts as to how they could and should obey their Lord and Savior. What I want to emphasize is that developed largely because of the concept of what the Bible was as the Reformers began to rediscover it. They realized the Bible is not a book of precepts, instructions, and commands like a military manual. Rather, the Bible is a book written by various authors at various times in history as expressions of the way people understood their relationship with God. Christians have been firm in believing that it was God's own Holy Spirit that led people to write these books and even guided their writing. Yet they were fully human authors, expressing fully human thoughts about how God interacted with his people and how his people should interact with him. Most frequently in the Bible, that is termed the covenant relationship between God and those who believe in him and seek to live faithfully in a covenant relationship with him. That can be expressed by understanding that for the Protestants, the Bible is not a book about God, but neither is it a book about religious people. It is a book about the covenant relationship between the sovereign, loving God of heaven and earth and his obedient, loving people serving here on earth. And so when Ulrich Zwingli gathered people at 6 o'clock a.m. every morning in the church to hear the word of God proclaimed, his job was not to tell these people what their assignments for the day were. He did not ask people to come to the church at 6 o'clock on their way to work so that they could get a list of instructions and job assignments for the day. Instead, he asked them to stop at the church to hear the Bible for themselves so that they could learn how to love God more fully with what the Bible calls their heart, soul, strength, and mind, and, as the Bible says, to love their neighbors as themselves. Now, it's already been mentioned this morning that certain Protestants, notably the Scottish Protestants, tried to use this as a foundation for political organization. Remember that if the Bible were only a book of divine laws and instructions, then you need a church and priests to determine for you how those instructions apply to your life. The way a police force and a court applies the job, applies laws to your life. But if the Bible is a book designed to enable you as a faithful servant of a loving covenant Lord to serve him better, then you need that Bible for yourself. And you need to make those decisions for yourself as well. So whether you do as the Scottish Protestants did and try to build a whole government structure on a covenant basis, or swim, simply remember that even today in Switzerland, where Zwingli's impact was felt most fully, that country today still makes major social and political questions. They settle those questions by a vote of the people, by a plebiscite. Because you don't need a government to tell you what to think. You certainly do not need the government using the Bible as a secret code book to demand your obedience. Instead, people must be given the Bible so that they will know how to honor God more fully and make their own decisions on what that means in their individual lives and in their social relationships together. The Bible is a covenant book that recognizes and instructs us in understanding that we are responsible to God and responsible for our neighbor in every part of life.
And that leads us to the third footprint. We also recognize with what the Protestant Reformation calls, let me begin again. We also can recognize that the Protestant Reformation provides a solution to what economists call the tragedy of the commons. You are probably familiar with that issue. The problem economists identify is this. Most economists believe that people make economic decisions based on their own individual self-interest. But if so, then what does that do for all the open spaces we share together in common? Think, for instance, of the world's oceans. Individual fishing fleets will want to harvest everything they can of a particular species of fish, regardless of whether it harms other species of sea life or whether it depletes fishing stocks for future generations. And that doesn't say anything about trash. That is simply tossed into the world's oceans, regardless of the impact it may have on other countries bordering on those oceans or on future generations using the oceans. However, in the Protestant way of thinking, all the world belongs to God. And each person in the world is responsible directly to him for what they do with his world. The commons, in other words, doesn't belong to nobody so that we can be just as careless as we want, nor does it belong to everybody so that nobody can use it for fear that we might take something away from one of the other owners. No, the commons, all the world, belongs to God alone and he has given humanity the responsibility both individually and communally to develop and use that world for his glory and for the human flourishing of all people within his world who are made in his image. That's where the great reformer John Calvin comes in. John Calvin, Jean Calvin, was a French lawyer who helped organize the city of Geneva, Switzerland in a way that brought prosperity and health to all the citizens and made it a magnet for other Protestant refugees from other countries as well. Now, he was a great theologian, but he was an equally great public administrator who looked for ways to organize the city so that biblical principles could be established. He did insist the church should not be running the government, but the government should organize itself on principles taught in the Bible. Not that the government should tell people they needed to be Protestants, but the government should enable people to live lives of human flourishing. For instance, the city of Geneva then established Sabbath laws, laws regulating and, de and requiring rest on the Sabbath day. Not because that was a re a, a church-like thing to do, but because that enabled everyone, whatever your social class, to have a day off. The wealthy never worked seven days a week. The poor people had to work seven days a week. That was an early labor protection law, recognizing that the principles of the Bible about the Sabbath were for human flourishing and providing the opportunities for days of worship dedicated to God. And it was the responsibility of the government then to enable people to enjoy a day of human flourishing and have an opportunity for worship. Similarly, John Calvin organized one of the first municipal sanitation systems. He knew not only wealthy people needed access to clean water and disease-free living environments. The wealthy could just dump their refuse into the streets where the poor were living. But that was not biblical covenant living according to Reformation principles. And so sanitation and waste management was considered a holy duty of the government to provide. Nor did the reformers believe you had to be a Christian to benefit from the biblical principles applied to civic life. They believed everyone must be touched by the care of others. 
That's why it's no surprise that Geneva, Switzerland is where the Red Cross was first organized to give mercy to people who are caught in war and disaster. Yet even that was not regarded as strictly a, an only Christian duty. They believed others too could see those responsibilities and join in them. And so already in 1919, the Red Crescent and Red Cross Combined Association was formed where Christians and Muslims could assist each other in carrying out those human civic responsibilities. The impact of the Reformation goes far beyond just the Reformation churches. Now, as I said, I don't have time to cover all five footprints. The fourth footprint, was a, which is a very interesting one, I believe, is that as out of the Reformation, that the principle of mutually respecting sovereign nations emerged. It was out of the Reformation, and it was a child of the Reformation, Hugo Grotius, that became the father of, of international law. And it was in Hugo Grotius's city of The Hague in the Netherlands that the International Court of Justice still resides. Similarly, the city in which governance of war and conflict was established and regulated is called the Geneva Conventions, again after the city where the heritage of John Calvin and the Reformation continues. The fifth footprint, if we had time, that I would cover would be pointing out that the Reformation provides an alternative to revolution. Reformation, not revolution, was the slogan, and that has been mentioned already today as well. And so the heritage that my ancestors were steeped in through centuries of Protestant understanding and that they brought across the ocean when they came to America are still the footprints that we live with today. There are more than five, but those are five that have been particularly significant and people walk in those footprints, whether we're in the United States, whether we're in Albania, whether we're in Germany, whether we're in the Netherlands, or wherever in the world God may place us, and that's why, as we walk in those footsteps, we can truly say, to God alone, be all the glory. Thank you very much, Professor Kahn. Thank you.